All I see in this city is cranes. I walk anywhere, I see these little sites over here with cranes, cranes, cranes. I, I, I must be crazy. Maybe it's the erector set in me. So what's going on? All this cranes, all this construction, all this development, lots of things are happening throughout the city and New Jersey. So today I've assembled this group, a very eclectic group of developers, counselors, and bankers to provide their insight on crane, 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 or massive development taking place in, new, in the metropolitan area. My guest today includes Bruce Eichner, who is the chairman and CEO of the Continuum Company, who is building with cranes two major developments. Uh, Larry Corman, who is the co-CEO of Corman Communities, president of AKA Hotel and Suites, who is also building a couple of things and also converting. Uh, Brian Cohn, who is a partner at Foley and Lardner. You're not building, but you're advising these people. And last but not least, the only way you can build is you have to have the guy with the money. So I have Ben Stacks, who is the market manager for the Metropolitan Region for Capital One Bank. So since I know you are, you got one project, is 200, how much is these two developments going to cost? Oh, approximately $700 million. I was going to bet that, okay, so $700 million, that's a lot of shekels, as one would say, you know? It's a lot of shekels. You know, are you, are we worried, okay, with a massive amount of new developments, or as I said, I have my crystal apple over here. Are we, you know, is it cautious optimism? I mean, do you think some guys are going to make it and some guys aren't? You remember 2008 was not too many years ago, Bruce. I think to the extent that we are looking at three things. We're looking at pricing for acquisitions of land of $1,000 a foot, which is a very difficult number to absorb. The second thing we're looking at- It's just at, an extra zero, right? Um, it's an extra zero, but uh, somebody has to put up most of that zero. I think the second thing we're looking at is a substantial increase in supply. So the projection for 2014 was approximately 2,500 units for new condominiums in Manhattan and um, in approximately 45 projects. The projection for 2015 is approximately 6,200 condominiums in approximately 120 projects. Of the 120 projects, approximately 50 are conversions and approximately 70 are new construction. For 2016, you're looking at approximately 100 projects, totaling approximately 6,700 units. So 6,700 and 6,200 is nigh on 13,000. Yeah, but you know, if, you, if, I had, if I had a residential broker here, which as I said, I normally don't because they're too, too exuberant about the market, uh, they'd say in, in the city of New York, for 13,000 units to be absorbed, you know, a couple of Russians, a couple of Chinese, you know, it wouldn't be difficult, but it's not that easy, you know, and, and I understand with you. Larry, you, you, you have, a, in my opinion, the best suite hotels around, and now you're converting. Why are you converting some of these, and you're also building in Lower Manhattan? Uh, it's a select, uh, exclusive amount that we're going to add to each property, and the reason is, is to, one, take the offering to the next level to justify uh, improving the kitchens, bathrooms, adding new common areas. It's also a way in which to compete with other developers to buy the next level up of residential buildings. Uh, you have to have that justification for your financial partner to be able to absorb the higher costs associated with uh, the newer, better you know, I, properties. I think, you know, a number of years ago, there were properties being converted. There's a hotel, uh, Lombardi. Yeah. Lombardi Hotel. Uh, is a hotel, but it's 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 really people owning 
the apartments and then they put it in the, in the pool. Is that going to be? Well, it, it's individuals from around the world, what we call global, res, uh, global, global citizen, who wants to own a slice of New York City, own a slice of AK, have the lifestyle, have the services of a hotel, but enjoy the privacy of a condominium, the space, the size, uh, and have the access that AK uh, right, offers the all over the so, world. Yeah. Okay, so those things are now going to be coming into your competition also. I mean, he, he may be at a lower It's a price different point. type it's, of offering than a, a traditional condominium. It's a situation, but it, it's an, it, in the numbers, you may have not even calculated what he's doing or what other people are doing with conversions today. I think that um, I did not include, I'm talking about apartment house conversions. Okay. But there's one other statistic that's significant, and that is of the approximately 70 projects that are for new construction that are coming on the market in New York, less than five are at $2,000 a foot. Or less. Or less. Or less. Right. So, so, and so there are 14 that are more than $3,000. I, I, I think this is an affordability issue, quite frankly. Um, and it's not just the condo market, it's the are residential. Are you involved res with that unique affordable condo? Which one? On First Avenue? The which? The Sutton? Uh, Not too far. For, for, for Toll Brothers? Brothers? Yes, we are. Okay. Which has a very interesting situation that there are, I'm not sure of the percentage, maybe 20%. Mm -hmm. 20% of the units in this building which is being constructed on First Avenue between 53rd and 54th, uh, 52nd and 53rd Street are affordable. Are affordable. And these are permanently affordable uh, condos that somebody's going to be able to move into this building based on income bands, similar to the 80-20 that you have in the residential apartments in Harlem, that these people are going to be able to buy an apartment over there for as low as $500 a foot. Sure. You know, which is because, and what's the benefit is that the other people who are buying at the market rate are going to have a 20-year tax abatement, 10 years with no taxes mm -hmm. and 10 years without. Mm -hmm. You as the counselor, when people come to you, how do you, how do you, how, you know, like Bruce said, the money price per foot, and like we were talking before in the green room about the construction costs, how do you tell somebody who's a developer what to do? So much, so much of the development right now is trending toward the higher end, to the mo you know, toward the, the other 95% of these units being built are but trending toward Manhattan. the higher end. Well, even, even outside Manhattan, in Brooklyn and in Long Island City, there's so much, there, there may be so much demand, but the only thing that makes sense is to build toward the higher end. Because people need those numbers to justify the sellouts. Exactly. So what's been happening is, is people need the numbers to justify the sellouts, mm -hmm. and what they're doing is they're, they're, stretching, they're stretching the numbers, and one of the things we were speaking about earlier is they're looking at other ways to monetize off of the asset. Mm -hmm. So one driver is to look at the value in the retail, it, to the extent that there's an opportunity to also monetize off the retail, or to monetize off of other accessory um, uses to the property. But primarily when, for example, I represent many sponsors who are also developers, and then I also represent a number of people who are making private equity investments in these, and oftentimes it may be their first or second time venturing into the real estate space. So then you have to think through all of the, found, the, the, the economics and all of the fundamentals, including who is your sponsor, who is the lender, how is this going to be built, and the timing in the marketplace, how quick can they get their but shovel you know, on the ground? <clears throat> but with regard to that, you know, you're the banker. How are you, and you're, you're a conservative banker like I am. How do you, how do you look at this? that, you know, there are new banks in town who are taking risks, okay? They may be coming from the Midwest, like the Ozarks, okay? Or other institutions, or maybe they're Spanish lenders who say, you know, I want to put out money over here, you know? Because it's, it's, it's it, you know, as they say, location, location, location. For us, it's sponsorship, sponsorship, and sponsorship. I mean, there's no doubt about um, the fact that, you know, we're getting into a very crowded market at this point. We're absolutely looking for people that have the wherewithal to, to you know, to not only build these things, um, but to withstand, you know, a lot of different market conditions. You know, and so, well, no, I mean, I, I think it's, you know, and so, you know, it's an interesting part in the cycle, too, where, you know, a lot of the New York banks or, you know, banks that are committed to New York have been here for a long time. Um, did a lot of stuff the last few years. They're you know, you're starting to see a lot of the, you know, kind of traditional old line New York banks 
take a step back or get full on construction or say, look, you know, we're not going to do as much construction as we did last year because we are worried about the, you know, the volume. Yes, Brian. I was just going to say, following what you said, when we were coming out of the last cycle, when you were sort of coming into recovery, so many bankers who were in construction lending, they would only lend to the people who they knew and who they had success with for series of cycles. And now while that's loosening, I don't see it loosening that much. That's true. But Very as true. we were saying before, there are, <clears throat> okay, you know, there's the private equity funds and the mortgage REITs, the Starwoods, the Blackstone, and other people like that who have money, who are going to put it out because sometimes you lend at a high rate of return or you don't mind owning the property that some people have done over the years, you know, in, in this situation. But Bruce made a great comment in, in the green room about some of these developments that were planned, that didn't come to fruition. They were planned in 2006, 2007, 2008, and they were sold in 2012. If you look at the, the real financial feasibility and you take all the costs involved, even though they say they, they were profitable, they weren't profitable. Well, they were profitable for someone. The question is who the someone is. And your point, Ben, which, which I thought was when we were in the green room, which is a really interesting evolutionary point, mm -hmm. is that from a lender's perspective, um, it's now no longer enough to be able to say that I'm in there for uh, a good price because if the project gets in trouble because of the change in the regulatory world mm -hmm. and the requirements that the federal regulators have placed on banks. So if you have a project, even if the project is money good, to use a, a, sure. a street word, sure. as you articulately said, that doesn't work for me as a lender because I'm being stuck having to reserve for I, it. I, I will bring that out right now. There are two hotels that were built specifically or geared to the gay and lesbian population. One of them is, is paying their debt service without any problem. Another one is in trouble and it's going to auction next week or it's going to auction. The regulator, this is, both loans were made by a credit union. And the credit union is, okay, and he says, my basis is so low, my basis is so low. The regulator said, I don't care what your basis is, but, I, and this is a, an actual reality. And that's also, in the, and I look at this in the hospitality market because you've built such a, a great brand and a company. There are people out there who believe that if they build a hotel, no matter where, in a mid-block location, it's going to do well. I mean, you know, the, you know, not every location. I mean, I look at Long Island City, which has some great potential maybe for residential, but you have 43 hotels in Long Island City all next to each other. If there's a blip in the market over there, you're going to have plenty of hotels available. I mean... You're going to have the same market conditions. You're going to have good operators, bad operators. In tougher times, the bad operators will not do as well. And in general, if you get great location, you do a little better in good times. You're a little bit more protective in bad times. Uh, so I think those so same market conditions exist. We were also talking in the green room about, you know, besides the, the, the cranes, the cranes today, some of the cranes are no longer look for the union label uh, on the cranes. There is more construction. I think Cranes recently wrote an article and a couple of the other publications Cranes talking about the amount of construction which is non-union. And Bruce was bringing up before the fact that many of these non-union were really places that have, perhaps we would say, two sides of the coin to the card. You know, they have one card with the union bug and one card which is the non-union situation. Uh, and it's changed today. Some of the biggest projects in New York are, are, are non-union. How do you as a banker look at union versus non-union? You know, look, I think, I think the, the outgrowth of a lot of that has been because of the, the demand on construction. Um, you know, there's, there's so many, pro reason why we're here, there's so many projects going on. Um, even two years ago, we were hearing of, of uh, general contractors that were turning down business because they had too much and they didn't want to, you know, hire on new teams to, uh, to do shoddy jobs. So I mean, they, they, they push business away. One of our mutual friends, uh, you know, who was a GC, 
is only building for himself today. Exactly. You know, right. you know it's, right. it's, it's basically Douglas then says, hey, I'm not building for anyone else. I'm only going to build for myself. Sure. Uh, you know, and there's been a de de decrease in the number of union shops. I mean, Plaza has had change of ownership and there's a variety of situations. How do your clients who are young guys who are in the market, how do they look at a deal? How do they focus at a deal with regard to construction costs, land costs, you know, development costs, you know, it's not somebody who's been around the market a couple sure. of years. I don't want to age you, but <laughs> a lot of a lot of them are looking for there's this whole talk of off market deals and I've I've you've dealt with this you know on something, a number of your of your story shows. that I heard about value added. Yeah. I don't know all of a sudden everybody came up with value added. But, but everybody, if you think about it property is value added, right? You know? But if you think about it when the market gets heated like this and the val and the the cost per square foot of land rises those deals that you looked at that looked so complicated for example a deal where there were fan family members feuding for years or a deal where there's a, a lender and a and a borrower from 2007 still locked and have, have their horns locked when you look at those deals you may have passed over them before but now they look a little different now it looks like you can unlock the value because it's worth taking the extra risk, spending the extra money. So some of the younger entrants in the market who are creative and um, including people who have been in the market for a while and really think through these problems and are very good at developing relationships with the family members or the people who own these assets are unlocking value by getting themselves involved in these complicated deals and then out comes something that's a little bit below the pressure point. And that's that's a great point. I've talked to one of our, our developer clients who has done exactly that on two recent deals. He's been on your show actually. Um, and you know, so they're, they're entering into these projects at very attractive basis. A and you know, these are types of things that we will finance. You know, the, the, the people that are buying stuff on the market today and paying, you know, huge numbers, it's really difficult right, as a lender to sit there and make because, sense of it. Okay, Fantastic. generation families, okay, or not families in the business, people who've had properties over there, you know, they have, the biggest problem is tr transitioning the gen next generation of a family business, which I've done shows on that. And it's, it is a difficult situation. Working with a successful developer who can figure out tax ways to, 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 to change this really can help the deal which allows on a true value added, sure. but I think that's there are really There are obviously, there are tax considerations, but what's also there is now- I got a fourth generation over here. At exactly, least in the working on the fifth. Right. <laughs> but as the value, as the value of the prices go up, think about it from the perspective of the family who's trying to maybe address a, a, an internal issue. Maybe the numbers didn't make sense once you, once you sell the asset and distribute the income uh, two years ago, but now we're talking about something different. Now it makes sense to sell. It, it may sell. It may pay to sell, or it may pay to lease, which a number of people are saying, you know, will. Or it, it may pay to contribute the something. asset into a development joint venture with someone who has the skill set, a developer, a developer client. Where are the opportunities for development? Because we see a lot of cranes in certain sections of Manhattan. We're seeing enormous amount of cranes in Brooklyn and Queens. Where do you see inflation? <laughs> okay. Where do you see? I think there's still great value in New York City. We're in a global economy. Uh, there's a lot of uh, unsuredness everywhere else in the world. People are safe with America. New York is still the hallmark you, location. Do, 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 and do I think see, if you build quality, do you see people will come. And I did a show recently with office brokers. Do you see potential in the far west side or near the Hudson Yards? I'm we still feel more comfortable in the tried and true areas. Are you, Bruce? Well, I think two things. I think y your, your points about some form of value-added strategy, um, I've, I've, I think that there are deals that involve nonprofits. I think there are deals that involve whether you call them tax-structured deals something where there is some perceived value add strategy. The second thing is, I think that because Manhattan comes to your, been your point about affordability, mm -hmm. because $2,000 a foot seems to be the benchmark and new development, it is basically gonna drive people to Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. because so where I see opportunities for development, particularly for condos, particularly in the hot areas that people like Williamsburg, the Greenpoint section of Brooklyn on the water, if you can figure out the transportation um, and as the water taxis um, evolve. I think that it's going to be a combination of people that are displaced from Manhattan, displaced by $90 a foot rents and $2,500 a foot asking prices. And I think it's going to be in Manhattan if you can find a church, find a synagogue, do something where there's something where basically they don't have the money to do anything with the institution. It's going to be the same thing. Michael, on the periphery, there's not that much of a, a savings once you factor in all the costs but, associated but here, with it. But here's the, 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 the question. Transit-oriented developments, Ben's been on my show, we've discussed this before, is the real key. If you're near a train, it's the big thing. But I just noticed on Yimby that there was a site that uh, Ruby Schroen bought next to Trump Plaza, okay? Great location on the train right on the Coney Island, uh, Coney Island right next to the train as opposed to the traditional Coney Island on Neptune How Avenue. long is the commute from Coney Island? The commute Island. from this spot is 50 minutes to the city. 50. 50 minutes minimum. But this is near the train, so it's only a four-block walk, as opposed to most of Coney Island, where you get off the train in Stillwell Avenue, and then you got to walk in, into, challenging. into, into challenging. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and that could be affordable because the land cost over there was probably in the $200 range, so, you know, you could build certain affordability over there. How many of those people are commuting to Manhattan, though? I'd say... Then you're 100%. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They they are in community to Manhattan. It's you, right. you you have to if you're going to deal with affordability, and you're going to deal with something that is uh, where you're not talking about, you know, two days and two nights to get there. The best way that you're going to do that is to try to figure out campuses of nonprofits mm -hmm. that have underutilized land where you can do a deal with the nonprofit for a 99-year lease for a very reasonable ground rent and then go to the city of New York who, to this mayor who has run on a, uh, on a platform of providing affordability and offer something that will allow them to do what they want, which is either 50, 30, 20 housing or 100% AMI-based housing. But it's got to be because the city doesn't own any land and by the time they get through upzoning it, we all will be, our children's children will be looking for this. And you'll have all of Michael, we're making ours affordable because we're giving them their cake and eat it too. The people coming from overseas want to be in Midtown Manhattan. They don't want to take a commute, but then we run it out for them when they're not using it. So they cover their costs associated uh, with the exorbitant costs of being in Midtown Manhattan. So they're having their cake and eat it too. When they are here, they have the location. When they're not here, we're running it, and they uh, get all of that rent. Any thoughts about the suburbs, uh, you know, the tertiary markets? Well, I, I, I see that there's more and more focus on Westchester, on investing in communities north of the city where you have this strength of Metro North. People can get into the city or people who want to live in the city can get out to these, these yeah. various markets. Now, what's very interesting is, you know, Matt Cowley, who's owned more terrible offices in Westchester, has gone to the community boards whatever they call it in Westchester, it's not community boards, to get the zoning changed to convert some of these office buildings. Vacancy rates still in the 20s. In White Plains. Right. Yeah. In White Plains, so it's, yeah. it's being done. So that's, you know, that's a rezoning or whatever you want, but it's creating the housing that's needed, which are near the trains, not too far away. And We owned a third of that Matt Cali one, so two of them were offices. We were the residential and just recently sold that, and it's right next to the train, across from the mall that they were going to do inside out in White Plains. That was our first AK, unofficial AK, was right there with So Matt that Cali. was a hotel? It was uh, a furnished up. apartments. And more and more of this is welcomed by the municipalities because you're bringing in a tax base, you're bringing in shoppers, you're bringing in people who are going to revitalize a downtown that may have otherwise experienced blight. And more and more we're seeing, we're involved in deals in, in sort of the, the, the middle part of Westchester and New Rochelle. More and more of, uh, uh, of development is happening in Yonkers has seen tremendous growth. What about New Jersey? We're building in Hoboken uh, a property uh, with Rockefeller as well as uh, right next to the Jets facility. So we're doing two properties under our AV portfolio. Uh, and it's also bringing in great jobs. I think uh, there, I'm not going to repeat the company, but there's a large uh, multi, 
National company coming in there also, so it's bringing look, jobs. It's bringing Hoboken, residential. Jersey City. Look, I we think have a lot of I think in summation, you know, there there are some very good things. The whole question is Bruce and everyone else has brought up. You know, there's a question of how high can the prices that you can make these deals, and everything is predicated, truly predicated, that the crystal apple says we better make sure the economy stays good, okay? Because it's nice that the you know the price of oil is going down. But if the euro drops, a lot of our visitors to the, the Big Apple and buyers. And, and buyers may have a change. I'd like to thank Bruce, Larry, Brian, <laughs> and Ben, and I'll see you next week.